Thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Sword and Trowel. Uh, This is one of the most significant conversations Graham and I have had with a guest on this podcast. We have Dr. Timothy Decker, who is the author of the forthcoming book from Founders, A Revolutionary Reading of Romans 13, as our special guest. Uh, Every church, every Christian leader, especially every pastor who lived through 2020, needs to get a copy of this book. And to whet your appetite, you ought to listen to this conversation with the author. So please spread this around, and we hope that you will benefit from this conversation. Welcome to The Sword and Trial. The Sword and Trial is a podcast of Founders Ministries, and Founders exists for the recovery of the gospel and the reformation of local churches. I'm Tom Askell. And I'm Graham Gundon. We're delighted to have you join us today on this episode of The Sword and Trial. We particularly want to thank our Founders Alliance members and churches, those that support us. They enable us to do what we could not otherwise do with providing this type of content for you. Let me just say also, you can help us tremendously if you would subscribe to this podcast on your favorite platforms. Uh, If you'd pass it around and you would uh, be willing to leave a review for us, that helps the algorithms and ministries like this, podcasts like this are increasingly uh, being uh, downgraded through those algorithms and canceled. And so anything you can do to help us to keep this up and to spread this around is greatly appreciated. Well, we are delighted today to welcome from outside of Roanoke, Virginia, uh, Timothy Decker. Timothy, thank you for joining the uh, Sword and Trial today. It's a pleasure to be on uh, the Sword and the Trial. Yeah, Timothy is a pastor there. He's also an instructor, professor for Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary, for the IRBS Seminary, and uh, most significantly for us today, he has written a forthcoming book from Founders Press called The Revolutionary Reading of Romans 13, and uh, that's a significant book. Of course, Romans 13 is a significant chapter, been much in the news over the last few years. It'd be interesting to do a little Google analysis and see uh, how much Romans 13 has been Googled over the last couple of years versus you know, the 20 years prior or so. Mm, I'm yeah. sure there's a spike. Yeah. So, Timothy, thank you for joining us, and, and thanks for um, writing this book, man. I, what was the genesis of this book? I remember some of our early emails back and forth, but tell us... Uh, what was it that put a burr under your saddle to get a book like this out? Well, there's so many ways to answer that, I think. Um, th- this book was largely what I wish I had n- known and studied before 2020. Mm. <laughs> How I wish as a pastor I would have led our church uh, prior to 2020, one of God's good providences of all of that happened in that year and subsequent years was it taught us a lot of our deficiencies in our training, our biblical understanding and knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so the Genesis really became uh, at some point we started realizing there's no way that this is the, the shutdowns and, and mask mandates and so forth can be legitimized. And so we had to, uh, we started to slowly push back, not as quickly as I would have liked to have been able to say, but we we had some in our church ask us, are we doing right by Romans 13? And that was the text specifically. Mm. And so uh, between myself and my co-pastor, uh, it, w- it landed on me to preach on Romans 13. And as I was studying it, I came to realize, wow, was I woefully inadequate in my preparation. And so I spent a lot of time studying and researching. It turned out to be probably the longest sermon I've ever preached, uh, mm-hmm. much to the uh, demise <laughs> of my uh, dear folks. <laughs> but it, it, it made me realize there is far more here than, uh, uh, than I was even at present ready for. So after that sermon, I started doing more digging and I'm prone to academics. And so I started like, how, all right, how could I turn this into a journal article or something? And as I'm writing it, I'm thinking there's just way more here than just a a journal article. But honestly, I don't want to just write something for the academic community Mm -hmm. that will get read by two or three people and shoved to the side. This needs to be for the church. So I tried to shift gears a little bit and started to expand that and uh, to more of a, uh, you know, popular level, serious reader for the pastor, for the student type of 
type of setting. And when I was about four chapters in, I thought, all right, who, who should I contact? And I, I didn't know, I don't really know anybody. So I, I don't know how I, I think I might've just sent you an email. I think so. Uh, and then it was, uh, I was uh, at a pastor's conference in New Jersey and you called me or I called you. And we, from then on have been saying, all right, well, here's the idea. And you yeah. uh, didn't hate the idea. <laughs> and so that was, that was before it was even finished. Yeah. And so that was kind of lit a fire under my feet to, to finish a project. I had no idea it was going to turn into what it did. So, well, we're grateful that you did. And, uh, it is a much needed resource. And like you, uh, it's the kind of thing I wish I'd had mm. back 2017, 18, something like that. But, um, man, Romans 13 is such a crucial chapter and it probably was one of the most, maybe the most invoked chapter by conservative evangelicals in all of 2020 Mm -hmm. and 2021. Now, if you're wondering um, the direction that uh, Dr. Decker takes in his book, let me just read to you the, the subtitle of the book because it does set the parameters very clearly. A Biblical Case for Lawful Subjection to the Civil Magistrate, and that's what we all are accustomed to, but then he's got that important little word, and dutiful resistance to tyrants. Mm. And that's what was missing in uh, a lot of the dialogue, a lot of the counsel that was given to us. And I, I've got friends, I'm sure you do too, uh, respected leaders who would just at Romans 13, one friend I was on a phone conference call with him and some others. And shortly after uh, the two week to, flatten the curve announcement was made, you know, and everybody was doing that. Those are the good old uh, Yeah, that's right. You know, <laughs> it, it does put time in perspective, doesn't it? You know? Um, and so the, and, and you know, he had announced the closing of this church and somebody said, well, what do you, you know, when are you going to open again? He says, when the government tells me we can. Mm. And, um, you know, I was, I didn't see things nearly as clearly then as I do now, but going into it with some clarity, uh, realize that's crazy talk. Mm-hmm. That's crazy talk. Well, and we were in such a, <clears throat> in those days, we were, our congregation was in such a good position. The Lord had blessed us. We were in a, mm-hmm. a location, a state in which we were never, right. no, we were never told that we had to shut down or that right. we had to close down. But a lot of places, I mean, they, they had sheriffs on their property mm-hmm. uh, telling them you cannot go to church today. Yeah. Yeah. You remember those, uh, uh, elders meetings mm-hmm. we had, you know, we, mm-hmm. <laughs> during, during those first couple of weeks, we would socially distance six feet away in the chairs, you know, we were certain, children, yeah. we were children. Yeah, well, we're trying to obey, you know, I mean, all the trusted voices, oh, this is what you got to do, what you got to yeah. do. But we were exegeting the uh, mandates from our governor, the executive orders from governor DeSantis. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was so much better in Florida than a lot of other states, but he, he issued one and then almost immediately within a day or so issued a, um, an amended version of it that specifically talked about churches. Churches were, um, what was the language? Essential services. Essential services. Churches fell under the category of essential. Yeah. And it, it, and we debated, you know, that word services. I remember the emails flying back and forth. I mean, we spent way disproportionately too much time. If only we had Dr. Decker's book at <laughs> That's the time. Right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, how did you guys navigate that then in your own church? Well, we did not have a Governor DeSantis yeah, uh, in Virginia. And um, I would have liked to have said we did better. I, I actually, later on, it might have been in 2021, I had to, from the pulpit, um, you know, ask forgiveness to our members because we we closed down longer than I think was proper. Mm-hmm. Um, we kept back word and sacrament. And that, that's what really broke me realizing there were people in our church yearning yeah. to meet with Christ, meet with one another and, and to, to be nourished from the word and, and from the Lord's supper. And we just, we didn't do it. So we had to, uh, I, I had to confess, you know, our, our, our shortcoming, our, our failure, our sin. And, uh, that was a very sobering moment. So I would have liked to said, we, um, we we pushed back sooner, but we we were slow, and that that's why this book was so crucial for me. Had I known after what I'd researched, and 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 let me say too, I didn't uncover anything new. Right, um, I, I'm just rehashing old arguments, trying to give some you know bolstering some exegesis. Uh, I, I wish I had read better. I mm. wish I was 
more familiar with the tradition that I'm, you know, in line with. And, and so, yeah, I, we, we didn't handle it well. And looking back, hindsight is always 2020, which is now a very ironic expression as well. Uh, that was the year that all these things went south. So, yeah. Now, now your, uh, the book, your, your background academically is New Testament, correct? Yes, primarily. Yeah. And so the book is primarily an exegetical argument, right? It started that way until I realized, you know, m- most New Testament guys will tell you they like to do analysis, but analysis will only get you so far. You have to start doing synthesis, and that's yeah. where your your theologians really come in. I, I would like to say I did some synthesis, and it had to move out of the here's what it means, here's behind the text, and so forth. And I realized to, to get this to have any kind of traction, it's got to be written with the so what in mind, mm-hmm. what do we do with mm-hmm. this? And, and mm-hmm. so it started with that, you know, new Testament analysis, uh, you know, background and, you know, Greek exegesis still on a level that, you know, is, is manageable for, uh, you know, popular level for a serious reader, but you still have to go beyond that analysis and you have to start picking out, here's how we apply this. And that was probably the hardest part for me, but I think it was the most enriching for me as well. Mm. Amen. Let me commend you and your fellow elders uh, for standing before your congregation and and making that kind of declaration. Um, I, that is so rare. I mean, mm-hmm. you're now the second pastor that I know uh, mm. that has done that. Another one uh, that someone sent me from his church. He just sent out an e news or yeah newsletter to the church and said, "Look, we were wrong. I was wrong." And uh, please forgive us. We didn't see it as clearly as we do now. We're going forward. And there, there is a, an allergy to that kind of honest, humble statement on the part of too many Christian leaders mm-hmm. where it's like, oh, no, if we admit we were wrong, that's going to discount any kind of leadership we can have. When in, in reality, it's the opposite. Mm-hmm. Uh, that just builds credibility because nobody nobody who serves as an elder or church leader or leader of any kind of institution uh, has infallibility. And mm-hmm. if you pretend that you do, uh, that there's a warning bells that go off and think yeah. in Christians' minds. So kudos to you for that. I mean, we've had to do that in, in our church. I've had to do it, I should say. I mean, I was long before Graham got here. was one of the most significant ones. Our elders worked up, I think it was 11 or 12 points that uh, we stood before the congregation after a, a pretty significant controversy and said, here are things that we're admitting, confessing to you, asking for forgiveness that, you know, we mm-hmm. wish we'd seen clearer and done better. And the congregation was very forgiving as mm-hmm. a church has to be, if they're going to keep a pastor, you know? <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I've been here 37 years. I, I've told our folks, look, I, one of the main reasons God made me your pastor is to teach you how to forgive. <laughs> you know? so, That's good. I'm going to keep that one. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today for this conversation on the sword and the trial. I wanted to remind you as the time draws nearer that the Founders National Conference is coming up here in the next couple of months. Um, And I wanted to remind you of the pre-conference that is taking place before the National Conference. This conference is going to be with Dr. Jim Ranahan and Dr. Tom Askell. It is titled A Time for Confessionalism. Anyone who knows Founders Ministries knows that we are a big fan of the confession, the London Baptist Confession. And so Dr. Ranahan, Dr. Askell will be talking about that and what it means to be confessional. Uh, that it will take place January 17th uh, here at Grace Baptist Church. And so we'd encourage you to go to our website at founders.org to register for that pre-conference. So, um, I mean, you engage with a lot of old writers too. I mean, guys that uh, probably had they been alive in 2020 would have looked around and said, what's wrong with you people? You know, Why are you doing this? <laughs> so who, who did you find helpful as you try to uh, sort out, especially the pastoral practical aspects, once you'd done your exegetical work? Yeah. Well, uh, John Knox is one that <laughs> a lot of people would go to immediately. Samuel Rutherford. Um, th- th- those kinds of guys were very helpful in hearing how pastorally, and just getting into political theology. Mm-hmm. Um, I- I'm so thankful that you you at founders have started IOPT just because it's just a, it's filling a major gap. Yeah. And so reading on political theology, um, re- reading on the doctrine of the lesser magistrate, uh, by, uh, Trujella, I thought that was just so enlightening for me. And I'm asking myself, why have I never encountered this before? 
Mm-hmm. And so, uh, but then as you read, they're not saying anything new. Uh, it's not like sphere sovereignty was invented by Kuiper. It was just, <laughs> uh, uh, he might have coined the term, but yeah. Calvin was talking this way. Yeah. And there's a lot of reformers uh, that were talking this way. And so, uh, yeah, it just interacting with the, the right people and, and going all the way back. And um, so th- those were some major, major influences. I really appreciated John Murray's take. Um, I appreciated um, uh, Schaefer on, on this matter and then others that you don't always agree with, but it's helpful to have dialogue partners that, you know, point you in a good direction. They might come away with a different conclusion. And uh, I, I had helpful dialogue partners like that, some mm-hmm. that we were very close with, but not completely close with. And and they were helpful, too. And yeah. so I think Sam Waldron just uh, had a recent publication. And that was uh, extremely helpful to, to see. You know, sometimes I like Calvin, sometimes I don't like Calvin <laughs> and, and so forth. And yeah. yeah, so there was good reading partners there that um, though I, I called this a revolutionary reading of Romans 13, it doesn't mean that it's a new reading. Yeah. That's not what I'm implying by the by the term revolutionary, but rather the content of Revo- uh, Romans 13 has to do with private revolution. And I just kept repeating what, what many have said for centuries before me. Now, I'd be interested um, for you to kind of maybe give us a snapshot of the argument, you know, the, the last clause of that subtitle, um, the duty of... of um, of disobeying tyrants. I mean, it, it, when is that legitimate? I mean, biblically from, from Romans 13, because before 2020, this was not something that <laughs> anyone ever talked about unless you were talking about, you know, theoreticals in the, in the American revolution and that kind of stuff. But like, yeah. as if this could ever happen in our lifetime, as if this would ever be necessary in our lifetime. That's right. Russia, China, Cuba. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what are the principles there that uh, people can be looking for as they read the book? Well, to, to answer that, you even have to define what tyranny is and, and what makes tyranny so awful. And this is the part that I, I wasn't even expecting. And I think someone smarter than me and more organized than me should be writing this. So I apologize for those chapters. But uh, just doing a, a taxonomy of, of tyranny mm-hmm. and breaking down all the forms of tyranny, I think that was enlightening to realize Tyranny isn't just, um, you know, making you take a vaccine. It it comes in a lot of shapes and a lot of sizes. And so when you realize tyranny is simply going against God's law Mm. and uh, the, the, the servant of God uh, tasked by God to do a, uh, a job in the common kingdom and his refusal to do those things according to God's law, that would fall into the sphere of tyranny. And there's so many different ways that can fall out. And um, in, an illustration, I think I remember coming across just listening to the Sword in the Trial podcast was uh, laws that are arbitrarily given. Well, that, that's a form of tyranny. Right. And um, laws that are, you know, have unequal application, you know, uh, you know, it's it's good for, for thee, but not for me and, and so forth. That That's a form of tyranny. And, and what's interesting is you have biblical examples of, of all of these throughout the Bible uh, of when a magistrate would, would tyrannize. Um, it, another category, I thought this was you know interesting, uh, tyranny could be when the, the magistrate makes you sin against your conscience. When you, when you have a conscientious objection to, you know, uh, to avoid something or, or your conscience is just beholden to bow down three times and pray— as Daniel had in his conscience, he didn't have a biblical mandate, but he had in his conscience, based on a, a passage probably from Psalms, uh, to to bow down uh, three times a day. And, and the magistrate said, no, you're not allowed to do that. Well, in his conscience, he couldn't bear that. And so mm-hmm. uh, I, I can even hear people in, in 2020 saying, Daniel, just go in your closet and pray. You don't need to pray in front <laughs> mm-hmm. of the window, but his yeah. conscience wouldn't allow it. <clears throat> and so for the magistrate to force him to sin against his conscience, that's a form of tyranny. And so when you have a, a definition or a, just a, a, a taxonomy uh, of, of gradations of forms of tyranny, then you realize this is just forcing me to go against God's law, and therefore I have to resist that. It, it would be sin for me to not resist this, un, uh, this, this unlawful uh, use of force by the magistrate. And mm-hmm. so it really comes down to God's law. 
Yeah, that was one when when our church was thinking through the issue of the vaccine mandates because we had several in our congregation who worked for um, the federal government and they were being forced to get a vaccine, and they were seeking religious exemption. And you know, there's no po- place in the Bible you can go to and s- that says uh, thou shalt not take vaccines. Um, but they they had no desire to take <laughs> it, and they they really thought that it would have been sinful for them to take it for various reasons. And so we went to um, to Romans uh, 14 that you know you can't do it in faith. Well, that is sin. And so if you are sinning against your conscience, though it's not clearly spelled out in the word of God, like that is a violation of your religious liberty being forced to sin against your conscience. Um, so that was some of the reasoning that we gave in, you know, as we were required to give letters of religious exemption to, to those who requested them for their job during those vaccine mandate days. One of the areas that, that you've touched on and that people get confused on all the time is, um, and I think this happened in 2020 in, in spades with a lot of the leaders. Uh, well, there's nothing inherently sinful about wearing a mask. There's nothing inherently sinful mm-hmm. about social distancing. You know, all of the, what law is being broken here? And uh, it is a misunderstanding of authority. It, it's a misunderstanding of jurisdictions. Mm-hmm. And the, the way that I've gained some clarity, and we've talked about it here in our church. In fact, we did it this last Lord's Day uh, during a, a, a dialogue time that we had for our, our adults, is that as an elder of this church I serve, I have authority. And, you know, the members are told to obey those who have the rule over you. So if I were to say to one of our men, look, you bring me dinner every Tuesday at 6 o'clock, you know, I mean— Okay, what's wrong with that? Is there anything sinful about bringing somebody dinner? Is there anything sinful about eating dinner? Now, isn't he supposed to, I have legitimate authority. It, what's wrong with that? There's no sin inherent in any of the actions involved. The sin is, in terms of your book, it's tyrannical because I'm, I'm trying to exercise authority that has been delegated to me by, by Christ to shepherd this flock and I'm misusing that for my own purposes, which is beyond what Christ has called me to do as an elder of this church. You're stepping outside your jurisdiction of authority. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And man, there's yeah. been a lot of confusion on that. And again, your book helps to shed light on that whole issue. Yeah, well, and and, and so, yeah, that would be, you know, tyranny in the form of, you know, one sphere uh, imposing itself unjustly into another sphere. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and we, we, we think we talk about sphere, sphere sovereignty and, and the three institutions or spheres of the family, the government and the church, but there's also the individual sphere. We talk mm-hmm. about individual rights. That almost is a category in and of itself. Yeah. And that the mask was that there, there's no communal mask that we can put on. We all individually put on mask and to tell a parent to force your child to wear a mask is is the magistrate, you know, interjecting itself into the family sphere or for the government to tell a, an adult to put on a mask that's inter interposing on the personal sphere. Mm -hmm. And so that the, the error of tyranny there was, as you said, it's, they're in the wrong lane. They're, they're, they're trying to impose something that they have no jurisdiction to enforce. Yeah. And this, this discussion of individualism is, this is not just enlightenment individualism, (laughs) you know, that's what, what, it is a fourth sphere of authority. You know, the church is given the keys of the kingdom to wield its authority. The state is given the sword to wield its authority. The family is given the rod to wield its authority. And then the individual is given the conscience to wield authority Mm -hmm. over itself. And so this also is a fourth sphere of government that we actually have to take seriously. And it's not just an enlightenment thought kind of making its way into the church through the American revolution. Right. And all of those have to be instructed by the word of God. Yeah or right. it's chaos. Mm-hmm. And if this were understood more clearly, it would it would put dealing with abuse on such a healthier ground. Mm. I mean when husbands, you know, I'm I'm the head of this household, therefore you got to do this. And wives, how many times we've we seen this where you know godly women who really want to honor Christ, they oh you're supposed to be submissive to your husband, you know. Sarah obeyed Abraham called him Lord. And so my husband's telling me I got to do this. And you know, it's not technically sinful, but it it just creates chaos in my conscience and in my relationships and they get abused. 
Mm-hmm. And it happens in churches with elders, and it has certainly happened in governments with citizens. And if we don't understand this, then we're not going to be biblically strengthened to resist it. So it has to be taught. It has to be understood. It has to be uncovered. And, and your book is a, a wonderful uh, help to that very end. Thank you for joining us today for this conversation with Dr. Timothy Decker on his new forthcoming book, A Revolutionary Reading of Romans 13. The subtitle is A Biblical Case for Lawful Subjections to the Civil Magistrates and Dutiful Resistance to Tyrants. This has been a wonderful conversation thus far with Dr. Decker. Uh, this book will is on sale. It's in pre-sale on the the Founders website. You can go to press.founders.org and pick up a copy there. Uh, the shipments will be going out in February of 2024. I would encourage you to get your hands on a copy. A very helpful book in thinking through the civil magistrate and our duty to uh, subject ourselves to the civil magistrate and also our duty to resist tyrants as well. So go to press.founders.org and pick up one for yourself. Have, have you seen people beginning to apply this way of understanding authority and um, these uh, jurisdictional arenas in, in ways beyond just thinking about the government? Has, it, has that been something that you've helped shepherd people through or you've seen people have some lights go off and say, oh, okay. I think in Virginia, <clears throat> we, we saw that, especially with our recent gubernatorial election, mm. when we had so much issue with our our schools, our, our government schools and the way they were run. And so our former governor, uh, he pretty much dug his own grave on that one because mm. the government was essentially saying we're going to control how, yeah. you know, we dictate the curriculum and parents, you don't have a say. And right then, he, you know, we're, we're technically a blue state, but uh, we had a we have a Republican governor because there was that sphere sovereignty interaction there and, you know, the government trying to tell parents how we're going to educate your children. And the, the parents finally are starting to wake up and realize there's a problem with that. And so that that's just on a, on a more public level, um, you know, on, on a personal level um, we, we, we have definitely, you know, seen those kind of interactions uh, people in our own church stepping up more mm-hmm. and, and going to um the school board meetings, mm-hmm. praying for our magistrates and, and, and things and letting our magistrates know that we're praying for them too. And by name and realizing that, you know, we, we, we have a, a duty to them uh, to inform them of their biblical law that, that God has enumerated for them and, and to pray for them as scripture tells us to do. So, yeah, we, we've seen our, our, our own folks kind of expand what it means in terms of dutiful, subjection what what does that look like and, and you know sometimes it could be one of the one of the best things you could do for a tyrant to to show them honor is to resist them so that they might learn what they're doing that is so dishonorable yeah. that that could be a, a a mode of teaching just like a, a wife uh whose husband may not allow her to attend lord's day worship well one of the most honoring things that she could do for him is to show why christ is more important and she is going to disobey in essence her husband by obeying christ and that is a form of while we might call it disobedience she's honoring him Mm -hmm. by letting him know that there is a better way and here it is and yeah amen you let a tyrant go on in his tyranny and you support that you're not loving him Mm -hmm. that's that's not love that's hatred because he's on a pathway that is going to lead him in direct confrontation with the God against whom he's rebelling. Mm-hmm. And if yep. nobody is throwing flags, nobody's saying slow down, nobody's giving an alternative, uh, that is not love. So, brother, tell us, what does Romans 13 say about <laughs> uh, being obedient to lawful authorities? Well, I, I would break it down in two ways now that I've kind of thought about it a little bit more. Um, Romans 13 is not given to all citizens to just say, submit, do what you're told. Uh, In in the historical context, but even in the immediate context of Romans, of of the theological situation of comparing Romans 13 with other passages, Paul's argument there is to argue to those citizens who might have a bone to pick with Rome and the Roman Empire— you don't engage in private revolution. That's the title of the book, a revolutionary reading of Romans 13, that there's a, a way to go about this within the proper sphere, but you as private citizens 
and likely in the context that those Jewish Christians who have been exiled from Rome and are now returning, uh, allowed to return to Rome, um, they're, they might, with the other non-Messianic Jews who are returning, not like what Rome had done to them. And so I can imagine around the water cooler that they were probably speaking all kinds of ill against the government. And as we know, the New Testament makes it clear that there were a lot of Jewish revolutionaries. And um, Acts 5 records a couple of them for us. And so Paul's admonition is that in order for the gospel to go forth, we can't engage, Christians cannot engage, Christ, uh, citizens cannot mm. engage in private revolution. Now, if there's going to be any kind of lawful revolution, and it must be uh, undertaken by the magistrate, either the superior or the lesser magistrate. And I don't think that's what Paul's uh, talking about. He's talking about, you know, violent resistance. He's talking about rioting. He's talking about taking up arms almost in a terrorist kind of manner and seeking political ends by violence. And this is what he is speaking to um, for the citizen, and especially when he gets to 13.5, to the Christian, because they have a conscientious duty not to resist as a private citizen. Mm -hmm. And then in verses 3 and 4, uh, Paul addresses the magistrate, what the magistrate's duty ought to be to the citizen. And this is the part that gets left out of the conversation. As much as Paul addresses the citizen, he is also addressing the magistrate, and they have a very unique and singular job to punish the evildoer and to reward those who do well. Mm -hmm. And in order for them to punish the evildoer, we have to pay our taxes. We have to supply them with arms that they might bear the sword, but we, we have to be able to live in comfort knowing that we have a magistrate who will protect us. Well, when the magistrate pulls back that protection, they no longer send the police to do what the police are supposed to do, or uh, they now <clears throat> cause you to have to not be able to provide for yourself by shutting down your business. Well, now they're not doing their job. And so uh, Paul has has told the magistrate and, and given the church a prophetic voice to address the magistrate with, here's what your job is. Uh, nature tells you what your job is to protect, to you know punish the evildoer. But uh, God's word makes it very clear, and, and the church has a, a platform, especially by the, the representative of the church, the pastor or the pastors of the church. They, they, they should have a, a dignified uh, a, a role or a dignified office in such a way that they would have a voice and, um, and that the magistrate would hear that pastor. And I think you've had interactions, uh, Dr. Askell, with um, – you know, various magistrates and you, you've, you've lent your voice to them and they've listened to you. That's how it's supposed to go. And so there, there's this, this two pronged attack. I think Paul does in, in Romans 13, he addresses the citizen, but he addresses the magistrate. And then he brings it down to the Christian in verse five. We have a conscientious responsibility to submit to a lawful magistrate and, and, and one who is, is, is doing his servant duties uh, lawfully. And uh, we ought not, even if we don't like, we ought not to take up in private revolution, uh, take up arms and as private citizens, you know, seek out revolution. There are, mm -hmm. there are ways that the government can self-correct, but it's self-correction, not one sphere, a private or, or even a church sphere interacting with uh, the uh, magisterial sphere of, of the government. Mm, very good. Man, there's a boatload of uh, wonderful, helpful topics to unpack there. Um, we're not going to have time to do it all this time. We'd love to have you back and do it another time. But let me just ask this. Like in New Mexico, a couple of years ago, the governor announced uh, infringement upon the right to bear arms and uh, how this was going to be played out to confiscate arms in certain situations. And I think it was all, if not all, all but one or two of the sheriffs in New Mexico said, mm -hmm. we will not enforce this. Mm -hmm. I looked at that. I applauded it. I thought, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what sheriffs ought to do. That's right. You know, yeah, I, I think first Peter two says that there, you know, we, we pray for the, the emperor, the mm -hmm. king, and the king has given governors or the lesser magistrate authority mm -hmm. to, to carry out those punishments. And so the lesser magistrate does have this responsibility to interpose if the higher magistrate, in that case, the government, uh, the governor rather, has has given an unlawful uh, uh, order, which in probably their constitution 
that governor doesn't even have the authority to do. Mm -hmm. It is, it is not only uh, good, but it is, it is right. It is demanded of that lesser magistrate to step in like that. And those sheriffs were right in saying, we're not, not only are we not going to abide by this, but we're not going to enforce this. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're seeing a lot of other uh, lesser magistrates realize this is important. And which is why I'll tell my people, we need to be praying for our lesser magistrates. We need to be getting more involved in our local governments because that's where it really hits home. Mm -hmm. And uh, they need to know that we're praying for them. They, yeah. they, you know, pastors, let your magistrates know, we pray for you by name. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, school boards, we're praying for you because you have a important task to do and we want to pray for you, help you do this. They, they need to know that there is a church who will uh, hold them accountable, mm -hmm. but, but also lift them up before the Lord. Yeah, and that makes uh, w when when criticism does come from the church, and, and they do have to raise their voice to the civil magistrate, it makes it that much easier to hear when they know mm. this. Per these people have been praying for me for years, and now they yeah. have some hard words for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's Doesn't mean true. that they'll listen, but right. Yeah, you know, on this uh, on this issue of um, gun control in New Mexico, it was just a couple months ago. It wasn't a couple of years ago. Was it? Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, even even uh, taking their constitution as a state out of it, you know. If the if the civil magistrate has a duty to protect its citizens, I don't I don't see how you can see it anything other than tyrannical than to deprive citizens of the ability to protect themselves. Right. And I know a lot of brothers and sisters from different countries will look at America and say, <laughs> "Boy, you guys are just nuts with your Second Amendment." Uh, but I really do think that 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 is the case. Um, and so I think it was not only constitutionally right for the sheriffs, but I think even according to the law of God, it was right for them to not enforce that tyrannical law in New mm. Mexico. Yeah, you can yeah, send I, me I your would, your emails. <laughs> I, I would put that in the uh, sphere of tyranny as despotism to mm. accumulate power. That, that is the government accumulates so much power that they can do whatever they want to the people or mm -hmm. despotism could be take away power from the people so that they have no way to protect themselves. And so that would be a form of tyranny by way of despotism. Yeah. You know, again, I'm just going to throw this bomb and then we'll leave. But uh, <laughs> uh, and, and different forms of government obviously uh, exist throughout history and across the world today. And Romans 13 applies to them all. Mm. And so we, we want to be real careful with that. But one of the things I don't know that we've thought deeply enough about here in the United States of America is you know, who, who has the final authority? What is our highest authority? Our highest authority is not a person. It's a document. Mm. And in terms of people, uh, the, we are citizen kings. We have the authority as a nation because of the uh, democratic republic that it is mm -hmm. to make our voices heard and to uh, coalesce enough uh, power to make mm -hmm. changes. And whenever we start thinking like that, well, okay, this is different in, in terms of how I apply this and what my responsibilities are would be different here than Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. because of the governmental setup. Now, I think we need to do a lot more. Uh, reflection on that and careful uh, consideration of, okay, what does that, how should we be teaching our people, uh, not as individual revolutionaries, but as recognition that you have a responsibility in this republic mm -hmm. to exercise the duties and the privileges that have been granted to you by God in this republic as citizen kings. Yeah, you know, we want to blame the political class and the deep state and the swamp, whatever it is, for all the problems that we face. But yeah. the deep state is a reflection of the citizenry. Amen. Sad but one, true. One small way, if I could interject, <laughs> as yeah. pastors, that we can help do that is, at least here in America, instead of calling them our leaders, call <laughs> them our representatives. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Just that little nomenclature reminds them that they actually work for us according to the Constitution. We are a republic. That's right. You know, we the people are the government here, and they represent us. So even even pastors changing our language to help revivify that nuance could even be a, a helpful aid. Amen. And I, I use the language civil servants, which used mm -hmm. to be more commonly used mm -hmm. than it is today. But yeah, they are our servants. They are our representatives. That's a good word, brother. Well, Timothy, thank you so much for writing this uh, book, The Revolutionary Reading of Romans 13. Uh, it will be released, God willing, in February 2024. You can pre-order this book by going to founders.org, and uh, it's on a special pre-order sale. So I encourage you to get a copy of it. 
And if you're a pastor, you desperately need this book. If you're not a pastor, your pastor desperately needs this book. And do him a favor, uh, bless him, bless a congregation by ordering this this book and making it widely available. The threats and the challenges of 2020 will not remain in the past. Oh, no, no, no. That was preface. Mm -hmm. That was preface to what is coming. Mm -hmm. If I'm no prophet, but uh, if I'm understanding things at all, I believe that what we are about to face will make what we have faced um, not look that significant. Mm -hmm. Brother, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. And thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Sword and Trial. If we could serve you in any way in Founders Ministries, please uh, let us know how we might do that. And anything you can do to help spread this podcast around this very important conversation with Dr. Decker, uh, we would be grateful for your help in doing so. Why are we here? What is the most important thing in the world? One of our greatest problems is, is forgetting. We, we forget what God has done for us. We forget what God has taught us. We forget things that we have experienced. If we don't pause, if we don't think deeply, if we aren't reminded again and again and again, we forget. It strikes me pretty significantly in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ. Why in the world would Paul tell a pastor to remember Christ? Well, he's not going to forget that Jesus Christ lived and that Jesus Christ taught, but he's going to forget the significance of Christ. Christ is ultimately our mission. The church is the body of Christ. A church has to focus on the supremacy of Christ because that's why we are church. Christ is supreme over all. The church's great mission is to preach Christ. We're there to win souls. We're there to advance Christ's kingdom. The problem with the world is not that they don't agree with me. The problem is that they don't bow the knee to Christ. So that's why we're going to gather, to specifically, explicitly focus on the supremacy of Christ, to do our best to remind each other of the centrality of Christ, the beauty of Christ, the glory of Christ. So join us in Fort Myers, Florida, January 18th through 20th, 2024 as we focus on Jesus Christ. I hope to see you there.